This week's episode was brought to you by Maddie Finney. If you too would like to support the show and help keep the content coming, consider visiting www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit, where a $5 pledge will get you our extended episodes, bonus content, two big old stickers sent to you while supplies last, and an invite to our Discord server where we enjoy discussing topics related to the show and sometimes even play Minecraft together. It's just my voice during the show, but Mari does join us about halfway and thank goodness she does because during the extended episode we compare notes about different cosmologies we had a great time thank you for listening and we hope you enjoy the show that's the thing about having like friendly funny banter in the beginning of the show and by yourself you're just like a a crazy man just yelling about jesus god I wonder how long until the the sound police eventually find me and put their big fat boot on me so I have to lick it like Alex at the Clockwork Orange. Hello everybody and welcome to the whole rabbit where we don't just stand on the beach soaking in the sea spray, gently absorbing the ambience of nature's glory. No, we turn it into a giant salty metaphor about waking up naked, stranded and hungry, mucous membranes clogged with glass-like shards of sand on a desert island inhabited by zombies who've turned mad by listening to Usher's Yeah being played on repeat for 15 years straight, because today we're talking about the Demiurge. I'm your host, Luke Madrid, the Hack Rabbit, and this, my furry friends, might just be the most requested show to date. So please kick back, relax, spark yourself up a giant bowl of the devil's lettuce and, well, let us, let us move past this bad pun and begin the episode. But why now? Why now after so many episodes have you decided, okay, now's the time to talk about the Demiurge. We've hinted at it. We feel it in our guts. Anyone who's watched The Matrix, just, you've got it, okay? That's a Gnostic gospel and so is mandy those are both gnostic gospels and you can have those because the real gnostic gospels have been lost and burned and buried in history and if we are to believe some of their assumptions the gnosis can come upon you at any time and creators and artists can tap into it and they're going to create Gnostic Gospels. It's fan fiction in some sense. Jesus did this. Jesus did that. And then the church is like, no, he didn't. That's pretty much what uh, Irenaeus did. If you ever hear that word or name again, it's because the church had this dude named Irenaeus who's like, see all these other Christians? They don't count. And let me tell you why. And then it's his accounts that informed the world about Gnosticism. And so we actually have mainly depended on things like the Matrix um, until 1945, when we discovered the Nag Hammadi Library and also some material in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. They have some interest. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a very interesting tale about how they came to be. But if, okay, so, okay, Mr. Yuri Bezimov, who says, oh, you have to go back to your cultural roots in order to withstand the KGB Soviet influence of turning your country into communist gulag uh, shithole. You know, it's like, all right, I'll take your bluff, Mr. Yuri. Let's let's go back. Let's go way back into the classic literature that our teachers told us to read and we didn't because we were too busy watching the Chappelle show. Chappelle for President 2020. But now that I have a podcast where I talk about super duper serious stuff like the Demiurge, it's worth going back and digging into Plato, reading about the Socrates and really getting our underneath the fingernails dirty with our own cultural junk, because that's that's what Yuri Bezimov would want us to do. And since we want to preserve our democracy... We will turn our pages to Plato. Page of... You don't have a book. So just pretend you have a book. That's how things work now. The Plato book you are supposed to have but you do not is the Plato Timaeus. It's on Google. Really, you don't need to go to school. Okay, so... That's where the Demiurge makes his first appearance. It's a bunch of Greek dudes sitting around, Socrates among them, 
they're eating string cheese or something, discussing high-minded notions of metaphysics, ethics, and basically pushing their brain to the limit to see if their fancy company agrees. In this particular case, the crew is discussing the ideal civilization, the ways it should be run, and the right and proper members that ought to compose it. In the following passage, they're speaking of soldiers and how soldiers ought to be. Socrates says, We said, if I'm not mistaken, that the guardians should be gifted with a temperament in a high degree, both passionate and philosophical, and that then they would be as they ought to be, gentle to their friends and fierce with their enemies. Timaeus says, Certainly. Socrates then says, And what did we say of their education? Were they not to be trained in gymnastics and music and all other sorts of knowledge which were proper for them? Timaeus says, very true. Socrates goes on to say that soldiers ought to live together and strive solely towards the virtue of being better soldiers, only being paid enough to enjoy what commoners do. Do we live this way today? Has the expected state of living risen among commoners so much that we live in accordance with the principle now? We do observe that since these times, it has been common to at least separate the warrior class from the commoners, but within the Timaeus, although they are to be respected as authorities and defenders, they also ought not to strive towards an abundance of wealth or industry the way a commoner might be expected to. It's I'm not the biggest historian ever, but I am somewhat cognizant of the fact that the warrior classes have at times become a blight on the people that they're supposedly supposed to protect. And I believe feudal Japan is maybe one example. It appears that Socrates would like to prevent that ardently and says they ought to be friendly to their population, but vicious until death with their enemies. So far, so good, right? This isn't anything too weird. The next one knows about breeding kids through secret lots in order of their birthright. Seems kind of odd, though. Socrates says, and what about the procreation of children or rather not the proposal too singular to be forgotten for all wives and children were to be in common to the intent that no one should ever know his own child, but they were to imagine that they were all one family. Those who were within a suitable limit of age were to be brothers and sisters, those who were an elder generation, parents and grandparents, and those of a younger children and grandchildren. Timaeus says, yes, and the proposal is easy to remember, as you say. Socrates says, and do you also remember how, with a view of securing as far as we could Best breed, we said that the chief magistrates, male and female, should contrive secretly by the use of certain lots so to arrange the nuptial meeting that the bad of either sex and the good of either sex might pair with the either, that there be no quarreling on this account, for they would imagine that the union was a mere accident and was attributed to the lot. Timaeus says, I remember. Then Socrates says, and you remember we said that the children of the good parents were to be educated and the children of the bad secretly dispersed among the inferior citizens. And while they were growing up, the rulers were to be on the lookout and to bring up from below in their turn those who were worthy and those among themselves who were unworthy were to take the places of those who came up. So according to Socrates, some parents are just bad and their kids are t trash and to be secretly dispersed among inferior citizens. What's even weirder is it sounds like these pairings occur programmed ahead of time where the two people producing the child are entirely unawares or under the assumption that the pairing is divinely inspired or maybe an accident. Socrates speaks of these things quite plainly as if such measures are not beyond their means. Both prior and later appeals to their education and birthright are made to justify their authority on such measures matters. In short, a society artificed by a hidden hand who assigns value and usefulness to individuals by means of esoteric wisdom reserved entirely for themselves and their friends in the name of doing what is right and good for the public, well, the image of the demiurge and his archons have begun to appear. Critias, having satisfied his audience with the tale passed down from his ancestors, first heard at the knee of an Egyptian priest who reminds its recipients that even though they basically worship the same goddess, 
Nuit. They are a forgetful race of dirt children that don't even know their own history. And that ancient Athens stood as a hero against an ancient Atlantean aggressor superpower only to have its defenders suddenly sink into the sea along with the entire Atlantean continent. The whole reason it's even being brought up is because they're trying to think of a tale or a common history that they can present to Athens that will help bring its society up and help bring its culture to a higher place, a, a unified myth that everyone can get down on, something to bring the people together. And it's so funny because the Egyptian priest who's telling them this, he's like, basically, every time there's a deluge, you people forget your history. And we have like eight of them recorded your genealogies are just made up kid stuff, but we'll go ahead and tell you like what you need to know. And so, yeah, they they take this story and the whole idea is, is they get to tell Athens now, look, we were the heroes that defeated Atlantis. The Egyptians told us so. So once that's all been established, uh, Timaeus then begins to explain how God created everything. And this is where the idea of the Demiurge is first introduced, like properly. That which is apprehended by intelligence and reason is always in the same state. But that which is conceived by opinion with the help of sensation without reason is always in a process of becoming and perishing and never really is. Now, everything that becomes or is created must of necessity be created by some cause. For without a cause, nothing can be created. The work of the creator, whenever he looks upon the unchangeable and fashions the form and nature of his work after an unchangeable pattern, must necessarily be made fair and perfect. But when he looks to the created only and uses a created pattern, it is not fair or perfect. So here is established by Critias the idea of God as a first cause or creator who refers to a realm of uncreated or eternal forms, the word here used as patterns, to inform his craftsmanship, which is later deemed as good. Everyone will see that he must have looked to the eternal, for this world is the fairest of creations, and he is the best of causes. And having been created in this way, the world has been framed in the likeness of that which is apprehended by reason and mind, which is unchangeable, and must therefore of necessity, if this is admitted, be a copy of something. Now it is all important that the beginning of everything should be in accord to nature. And in speaking of the copy and the original, we may assume that the words are akin to the matter which they describe. When they relate to the lasting and permanent and intelligible, they ought to be lasting and unalterable and, as far as their nature allows, irrefutable and immovable, nothing less. But when they express only the copy or likeness and not the eternal things themselves, they need only be likely and analogous to real words. And being is to becoming, so truth is to belief. Wow, what did you say? So this statement is interesting and contains within it the seeds of an idea about God that Gnostics will grow into their theological garden. According to Critias, who's speaking most highly of the creator, he himself admits the dude is just copying what he sees in the eternal realm and producing something which, by such standards, cannot even be said to truly exist outside of being a half-illusion. Due to the nature of all material bodies and their inexorable arc from being created to their dissolution, never fully embodying the form from which they were copied. And for what? To be ascertained by opinions? To be enjoyed by that which is fundamentally divorced of truth and eternity? It's not hard to see how this character, the demiurge or public artificer, as he's here called, could be recapitulated to be the big bad guy on the scene. And so if the meaning of the word sin is to miss, what can be said of a creation whose entire body is composed of shoddy, impure copies that will never truly exist? It's really not that hard to see how the idea of a simulation is applied very readily to this whole metaphor. From where I'm standing... Uh, it doesn't seem that our 21st century Colonel Sanders Matrix TV screen dictator is that far off. After all, the machines did create a perfect world, but to their dismay, 
it didn't work. Did you know that the first Matrix was designed to be a perfect human world where none suffered, where everyone would be happy? It was a disaster. None would accept the program. Entire crops were lost. Some believe that we lacked the programming language to describe your perfect world. But I believe that as a species, human beings define their reality through misery and suffering. So the perfect world was a dream your primitive cerebrum kept trying to wake up from. Timaeus then explains the middle elements water and air were created to mediate between the vision giving fire and the sense giving earth. He explains how eternity is and how time imitates eternity by the perfect revolution of the heavens, which gives us seasons. He explains how the earth is the center of the universe to which the moon is closest in orbit to which the sun was second Lucifer and Hermes so-called or third and fourth respectively. This ordering and relationship of the planets mimics the Kabbalistic tree of life to some extent. And Timaeus does state, that there are only seven planets, the moon and sun being two of them. Timaeus then explains how the Demiurge created animals, I think. Thus far, until the birth of time, the created universe was in the likeness of the original. But in as much as all animals were not yet comprehended therein, it was still unlike. What remained, the creator then proceeded to fashion after the nature of the pattern. Now, as in the ideal animal, the mind perceives ideas or species of a certain nature and number. He thought that this created animal ought to have species of like nature and number. There are four such. One of them is the heavenly race of the gods. Another, the race of birds whose way is in the air. The third, the watery species and the fourth, the pedestrian and land creatures. Of the heavenly and divine, he created the greater part of fire, that they might be the brightest of all things and the fairest to behold. He fashioned them after the likeness of the universe in the figure of a circle and made them follow the intelligent motion of the supreme distributing them over the whole circumference of heaven, which was to be a true cosmos or glorious world spangled with them all over. So dude is talking about stars and being on their proper orbit. Then suddenly and without warning, he then starts to talk about how peoples are descended from the gods. And who are we to question? After all, they keep track of their genealogy. I thought this was particularly but particularly amusing because considering just a few minutes ago, he recounted how the Egyptian priesthood basically told them that their whole genealogy was nonsense. Anyway, Timaeus is like, we know that we have some families that are descended from the gods. How could they lie? And then he tries to describe how exactly that works. He says that God got together all the lesser gods Right. And says that you need to go and create humans, basically. So and then when the humans die, you get to collect their souls and they get to hang out with you in like your heavenly abode. So it's exactly like D&D. OK, this, now this is God talking. <clears throat> and now listen to my instructions. Three tribes of mortal beings remain to be created without them the universe will be incomplete, for it will not contain every kind of animal which it ought to contain, if it is to be perfect. On the other hand, if they were created by me and received life at my hands, they would be on an equality with the gods, in order that they may be mortal, that this universe may be truly universal. Do ye, according to your natures, betake yourselves to the formation of animals, imitating the power which was shown by me in creating you. The part of them worthy of the name immortal, which is called divine, and is the guiding principle of those who are willing to follow justice, and you, of that divine part I will myself sow the seed." And having made a beginning, we'll hand the work over to you. And do ye then interweave the mortal and the immortal, and make and beget living creatures, and give them food, and make them grow, and receive them again in death. 
I, I think that's the archons. They're like these fiery animal angel beings that create and fashion us and feed us and rule over the material world and then take our it is just like it's just like D. if you're good to your god you get to go to where your god is when you die but he also kind of says that if you are bad you get reincarnated as a woman and then if you continue to be bad, then you get reincarnated as a beast until eventually the cycle just continues and t- continues until you dissolve back into the noble elements. Uh, yeah, you know, that seems a bit patriarchal and woman hating just a bit. I'm just saying it's apparently he got this all from astronomy. Uh, one reason the creator does it this way is that he's guiltless if something goes wrong on behalf of the Archons. After all, he told them what to do. And if they mess up, it's on them. After all, the boss knows their true potential, and that is to be perfect at all times, no matter what. So just using my imagination, it's not hard for me to think about how this might look to somebody in another religion, somebody that saw the Greeks or the Romans as an oppressive power, or that they used their intellect and their fancy ideas as a weapon. Because they certainly excelled at war. And we learned in the Wheel in the Sky episode that much of during the Age of Ares was the advancement of both laws and weapons of war. So there's a certain legalistic way of looking at all of this. It seems like they're justifying all these ontological mechanisms of the universe based on how pleasant they sound and how smart they sound. But to be fair, this is what they had to work with. They saw how the stars revolved. They saw how the planets would appear to change course. And they were just seeking an explanation. But in doing so, you naturally project your own psyche onto what's around you. And so credit where credit's due. These Greeks who had mastered sculpture, who had mastered architecture, who had taken the mythologies of the of their ancestors and of the local tribes and had integrated it into a philosophical whole, felt that they had license to comment on how the creator himself had fashioned the conceivable universe from chaos by observing something that was purely an abstraction. So when they say something that just sounds ridiculous to the modern mind, it's very easy to go, oh, they were just making it up. Well, Yeah, in some sense, they were because they were making their argument by looking, quote, up into what they felt was the eternal realm, the realm of abstraction or the realm of thought. And I'm sure to some of their wives, they must have sounded dumb AF, right? So anyway, so what follows is a very long explanation of how the elements work and compose us as beings. That's a story for another time. For now on, our investigation of the Demiurge is off to a decent start. Uh, Through Plato's historical document of the Timaeus, we have a glimpse at the ancient Greek metaphysics from which the Gnostics would generate their cosmology and build the god here nobly described into the biggest final boss ever imagined. Where this happens historically, though, is a bit contentious. What we know for sure is that Gnosticism was widespread within early Christianity until finally it was expelled by proto-Orthodox groups in the 2nd and 3rd century A.D., It's not uncommon for Christian historians to assert that that's the end of it. They were heretical, post-Christian side sect, and they earned their label by means of it being a false version of the true Christian religion. This is, of course, ignoring the hermetic teachings, which can be traced back to Old Kingdom Egypt over 2000 years ago. Recent insight, however, seems to point to Gnosticism finding its origins in mystic Judaism, particularly Merkaba mysticism, which was practiced 100 years prior to Christ and for about a thousand years afterwards. It centered on the practices of personal revelation and transcendental visions like the ones found in Ezekiel chapter one. So some of you might be saying, wait, Merkaba, like in from Valo Melchizedek's The Flower of Life? Yes, fucker, that one. Just older. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, Merkava mystics probably experienced ecstatic visions of the celestial hierarchies and the throne of God. Whoa. In Merkava mystical literature, the ascent of the visionary soul is described as a perilous journey through seven spheres or heavenly dwellings manned by hostile angels. Uh, 
The visionary's goal was to behold the divine throne situated on its chariot after having passed all of the hostile angels. The Merkava initiate, known as the Tenzu Im, would use specific angelic seals to placate and pass each wrathful angel on their way up through the Heikholot, or holy palaces, which would serve as the basis for the idea behind the Sephiroth, or, as they're known, wheels of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. I guess when you conflagrate wheels, chariots, and thrones all together, it begins to make some kind of sense. Recall how Plato's conception of the universe is broken down into magical fire creatures, or stars, which revolve in perfect orbits, wheels, around the planet, and who are responsible for creation, watching and gathering the souls in the name of sacred virtue. Thus, we can see how these mystics conceptualize the heavens as a series of conscious, living wheels upon which the gods would travel on their thrones, which were set on the paths by God to enclose and balance all of creation. I guess if you try and pass them in orbit, they get mad. I don't know, but I read in the research that if you did it wrong, if you used the wrong seal, or if you said their names incorrectly, or you showered wrong, or maybe you were just masturbating when you shouldn't have in the preparation part of the ritual, you could get burned up. Like, you could just light on fire, or you could go insane and just run off into the desert, like, with no underwear. Like, all sorts of, like, I think when my research had said out of the four people that this person had seen personally do it, only one of them had succeeded and the rest had suffered that fate. So, that was known to be a dangerous thing. You fast forward to the Abramelin, people also likewise have a hard time. So, it's it's sort of an interesting... Uh, tradition for magicians to sometimes on their paths up through the aethers to get their asses whooped by whatever higher dimensional consciousness they happen to be contacting do i sound like i'm making excuses anyway taking an adversarial approach to these divine creatures of fire as they're defined in the timaeus sounds a bit edgy and confrontational at first until we consider the sentiment that is well established by the ephesians likewise in Ephesians, it said, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. The sentiment here in Ephesians matches quite snugly to the philosophy of heavenly hosts or angels that preside over the material world and the ages, the darkness that they're stuck in, expressed through the revolving heavenly abodes, resisting the initiate on their path towards union with the Father. So by the time we arrive at the New Testament, the sentiment towards these heavenly abodes and their keepers has moved from being divine beings infused with God's essence and acting as a suitable go-between in accordance with one's nature to an oppressive force of material destiny aligned directly against the indwelling soul of the person to which only Christ was the cure and antidote. This appears to be a fairly obvious reason why Gnosticism found such comfortable soil within early Christianity. Christ stands in opposition to the Pharisees, the Roman Empire, and presumably the gods which backed them. One may feel justified choosing to see wickedness in high places and principalities and powers in a more colloquial sense, referring to the Romans and the Pharisees, but the motifs are nearly identical. And so much as the Merkava mystic must pass wrathful gatekeepers on the path to God, so too does Christ accuse the Pharisees in Luke 11.54. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering, you hindered. It is worth noting that this is one of the quotes attributed to Christ, both in the canonical Bible and in the Gospels of Thomas, which were discovered in Nag Hammadi in 1945. The 39th saying of Christ in the Gospels of Thomas goes, Jesus said, the Pharisees and the scholars have taken the keys of knowledge and have hidden them. They have not entered, nor have they allowed those who want to enter to do so. 
As for you, be as sly as snakes and simple as doves. Fortunately for Christians, though their entire gospel or good news, is that Christ is not dead and is currently alive and available for anyone who would call upon him. One such example can be found in Acts 2 during the Feast of Weeks. And when the day of Pentecost was finally come, they were all with one accord with one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. God, it's hot in this room. And there appeared unto the cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat each upon them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and begun to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So these early Christians, they would just like, well, this was supposed to be during the Feast of Weeks. But I think the idea was, is they were, would need to express some some of this truth to somebody and they would automatically be able to speak that person's language. I know it says they're like actually speaking that actual other language if you keep reading that section. But it also kind of sounds like they just have the ability to say what it is they need to say to make the other person understand what it is they're trying to say. Wow. Which is something I apparently can't do. So, however, um, things would not always remain for the early Christians as thus. As Christianity became more solidified and codified, the prospect of personal revelation seemed to be problematic in establishing any sort of unity or orthodoxy. Lon Milo Duquette discusses these early days and the eventual rejection of the early Christian doctrine of personal revelation. All other ideas, including many of the concepts that gave birth to Christianity, were labeled heretical and ruthlessly crushed. Personal, mystical, and visionary experiences, which were endemic in the infant church and which spawned concepts such as the resurrected Christ in the first place, were denounced as dangerous hallucinations, satanically inspired and impossible to substantiate. Such personal revelations served only to muddy the doctrinal waters of the new and partially crystallized church. Blind faith in the historical reality of the virgin birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus became the sole act necessary for salvation, and one's continued eligibility for paradise depended on the absolute surrender to the totalitarian hierarchy of the church. Simply put, those who remained loyal within the theological roles of the Roman Catholic system saw an ever-rising tide of apostasy, corruption, ebbing and growing from the outside, swallowing the true faith, splintering it into more pieces of wood than the cross could ever. The sentiment is still alive and powerful today. Father Barron, a well-known and respected exorcist of the RCC, can be found on YouTube expounding the devilish pollution of sex like Anglicanism and the righteous intolerance to submitting to doctrine from outside the Roman Catholic Church. So to a true Catholic, looking out beyond those walls reveals not even a world dominated by false religions who are not merely incorrect, but establish nodes of satanic influence spread intelligently through the fabric of every other religion and doctrine, constantly scheming to destroy the one true faith and her precious church. In fact, it has been well known as of late the Catholic Church is on overdrive mode, training more exorcists than ever in a concentrated effort to stop the ever-growing demonic incursion. The view from outside the Roman Catholic Church, though, is equally grim. I need only refer to the occasional childhood run-in with a Jack Chick track to emphasize the tendency of the evangelical community to paint the Roman Catholic Church as the abode from which the Antichrist will appear during the end times, deceiving the whole world into believing in him instead of Jesus Christ. So Luke, what the heck does this have to do with Gnosticism? Well, pretty much everything. It's a Gnostic idea that the world belongs to and is fashioned by the devil. And to abstain from it is to know God. After all, in Genesis, like in the Timaeus, it is God who fashions the world and it is good. This is a pretty important point, and it has a lot to do with our conceptions of the devil and what dominion the devil has. For instance, in Job, Satan isn't just walking along the shores, listening to rap music, smoking joints, and shooting homemade pornography. He's like hanging out as an angel with God being like, you know what, man, I think if, uh, I think if you weren't so good to Job, 
you know, I, I think he'd turn into a douchebag. And God's like, no. And Satan's like, you know, why don't you let me give it a try? And God's like, you know what? After all, yeah, go ahead. You do it. You give it a try. We'll see. We'll see if Joe breaks. I'm pretty sure I'm right after all, because being right is more important than, you know, Job and his family and his goats. <sighs> Stupid Job. But the idea is, is that God is in charge and that it's good. There's no devil in charge. That's not the correct idea in Christianity, at least as far as my research concluded. Some explanations against Gnosticism was, was that it was spiritual escapism and that true religion in Christianity was a pilgrimage and that the world was good. Some backup I have for this comes from Isaiah, where God is declaring to Jacob and Israel that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down, ye heavens from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation and let the righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe unto him that striveth against his maker. Let the potsherds strive against the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashion it, what makest thou? Or thy work, he hath no hands. So in short, Yahweh is like, you have no right to question me. I fashioned this place good, just like it was explained in the Timaeus. And there's no other God besides me. That's it. There's only me. All the bad stuff. It's meant to happen that way because of the law, which is good as well. So this is a philosophical fact, both in the Timaeus and the Bible. In both cases, one's spiritual health is measured by one's obedience to the principles laid out by this creator and involvement with the earth and its creatures in accordance with divine law. So when Jesus Christ says to Pontius Pilate, then Pilate entered into the halls of judgment again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered to him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself? Or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answers, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then why would servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews? But now my kingdom is not from hence. So he's saying, if this was my kingdom, if those people were serving my God, then why am I in this situation with you, Pontius Pilate? And with that, I'm going to have to introduce Mari Sama. Welcome to the show. Hey, everybody. I made it. We've been having recording and scheduling issues because suddenly everybody is very busy outside and we work. So it's causing scheduling stuff. But hey, welcome to the show. We were just making Thanks. a point that basically Christ is calling out the god of the times, the god of maybe both the the Pharisees and the Romans as not his god, maybe presuming that their god is the one that rules over earth and that his god is like the one from heaven, right? It's the, he's not of this earth. And so I think that plays into the whole Gnostic perspective 100% because in the Old Testament, God created the world good, but Jesus is like, no. Even the Greeks thought that the uh, Demiurge, the as the, he was known in Greek, the craftsman of this world was inherently good because it was a creator. But, you know, these Gnostics say that this creator, um, they called it a blind God that basically was unaware of the hierarchy above him and the one true God, and that's, which is yeah, apparently Jesus Christ was sent by the true God and not. Right. And that's sort of what it's the demiurge. Right. It sounds like what he's saying to Pontius Pilate. And I found some research here that says uh, Gershom Sholem once described Gnosticism as the greatest case of metaphysical anti-Semitism. And Professor Stephen Baim said Gnosticism would be better characterized as anti-Judaism. But the very same article that I found this in says that recent research shows because so much Gnosticism was grown up in a Judaic setting and from Merkaba mysticism, that this perspective is not as strong anymore. 
but it does it there is definitely something to be said for christ being like no this is like whatever you think is god i'm not that right and uh, that's why in christianity a lot of times you'll see a split between people that talk about the god of the old testament versus the god of the new testament yes so before jesus came again christians basically were jews so the old testament god is the god of the jews yahweh and when the Gnostics came out and started talking about this God being potentially a uh, misled, a foolish God that that's not aware of the real God and thinks it thinks that it's God because it can create material beings and matter. But uh, they basically just straight up said that the Jewish God is a false God. And it, I mean, that makes some sense, because if they're trying to update the, and like the new God always looks like a devil to the old God. And the old God always looks like a devil to the new God, basically. Correct. It's only, and what's funny is it's nowadays we're uncovering even more heretical or non-canonical texts. Uh, the Nag Hammadi, of course I said that funny. The Nag Hammadi Library, uh, so named for its places of discovery in Egypt, was only discovered in 45, and it contained three copies of the Apocrypha of John. It's a non-canonical scripture written in the Coptic language detailing an eventful day for John the Apostle following sometime after the Passion of Christ. So, St. John the Apostle is walking around the temple one day when a Pharisee by the name of Arimaeus approaches him to troll and says, where is your master whom thou followed? And he said to him, he has gone to the place from which he came. The Pharisee said to him with deception, did this Nazarene deceive you? He has filled your ears with lies and closed your hearts and turned you from the traditions of your fathers. This made John super emo, and he decided to go walk around in the desert alone. John starts to inwardly ask questions about Jesus. Where did he come from? Where did he go? I'm really hearing the chipmunks in my head right now. And then immediately as he's asking these questions inward, Jesus like splits the sky open and appears in spectacular fashion. And John is like, ah, and Jesus is like, whoa, buddy, don't worry, man. It's just me. I come to tell you the things. And John is like, OK, man, tell me the things. And then it gets weird. Uh, Jesus say the monad is a monarchy with nothing above it. It is he who exists as God and father of everything. The invisible one who is above everything who exists is in corruption, which is in the pure light into which no eye can look. He is the invisible spirit of whom it is not right to think of him as a God or something similar. He's more than a God since there's nothing above him. No one lords over him. He does not exist in something inferior to him since everything exists in him. For it is he who establishes himself. He is eternal since he does not need anything. For he is total perfection. He does not lack anything that he might be completed by it. Rather, he is always completely perfect in the light. And then he goes on to describe the light. I don't know. Should I describe it? It's just immeasurable. There's nothing before it to measure it. it invisible because there was no one before to see it. Right. Eternal since there is no time before it to, to examine it. <laughs> You know, there's it basically they're talking about the source energy of the entire universe that we know, including the spirit realm. So this is above even heaven. Uh, this is the source of all creation, which is kind of hard to conceive of. It was here in my research that the word aeon started getting used a lot. Let's see. One thing I did want to mention, like real quick, was that the Naga, and I learned this while I was researching the last episode, told the Dogon that the universes existed in pairs of seven, creating 14 total worlds, which is pretty much exactly what John is told here in this gospel, and that they are arranged in pairs, like syzygies between right. male and female. So those two stories line up pretty well. So um, let's. So what were you gonna say? What did you What did you find in your notes? That was interesting. We could. Well, I could. Pick for, on. I was just. I mean, I guess this uh, gospel of John actually touches on the creation story of the universe. It tries to, you know, put into words basically where everything has come from, and it also points out the fact that the demiurge. The demiurge is a product of basically a fall from heaven. So it was a mistake. Right. In the. And, yeah, in the Apocrypha of John, it, the like first there's this God, right? And then it emanates this perfect being, which here is described as forethought. 
and the name they give Forethought is Barbello. And Barbello is not the one who makes the mistake later. That's Sophia. No, no, that's that's their last daughter, the last eon to be emanated from We're, the pair. Right, Sophia, right? Correct. Okay, that's my girl. So what I thought was interesting, though, is that Forethought was also the name of Prometheus. Right, it does mirror the Greek text quite a bit. Um, but the it's interesting that the word barbello is actually related to the Coptic verb berber, which means to overflow or boil over. Oh wow! Because when they when they explain how she is created by the one source God, it's really he doesn't assemble her. Basically, what happens is his uh, the inner reflections of this being it starts to self analyze and self reflect on itself and. Eventually, its thought overflows out of itself, and that's what manifests Barbello. So he doesn't, and I'm using he as just an easier way to talk about this thing because it has no, it has no gender, it has everything in it. Yeah, Jesus does say you that. can't divide it. You can't divide it at all or call it these names. So when it when it reflects on itself, basically one of the um, one of the stories they wrote was that it looked down from heaven into the abyss or the great water, the great dark water and saw its reflection. And that's where Barbello came from. So she, she was just a reflection of, of God. Uh, when, when God's inner, uh, when God's introspection boiled over, so to speak, which if you're, if you say it, he, cause we're so used to, it kind of makes it sound like, ah, oh, it's just the woman is just the reflection of the male. But it's like, no, actually, this thing isn't even male and the first created being is female. That's actually what it is. So the first and the first expression of godhood is feminine in this from this perspective. Also, the whole fall perspective, it mirrors the whole Prometheus thing so closely because Prometheus steals the fire from heaven and gives it to the mortals. And then that's why Jupiter chains him to the rock with his imperial seal, the eagle or vulture picking out his liver you know, over and over. Yeah. It's like, so this, this like dovetails or peacock tails <laughs> with that whole thing pretty nice. well. Right. Um, but from, from Barbello joining with God, they emanated or manifested other uh, eons, which I would guess I would liken them to like archangels or like angels See now, or gods. They're even like gods really. Cause it's like you have a pantheon of them, but they're all, uh, it was described to me in this article of of like the eons are like fingers on the hand of God. So mm-hmm. it's like the hand is God. It's still one hand, but there's little peaks or like waves that come out of it that create these individual eons that and the eons are to act because because God can't act on anything. So it, it basically emanated all these personality types to try and to try and become dynamic and speak to itself and stuff like that. So from what I get, it was Barbello who was forethought and asked this quote unquote father for foreknowledge. And then the father's like, here's foreknowledge. And then she's like, I also want indestructibility, eternal life and truth. And he consented to all of these. And this created a pentad. And then this pentad itself is androgynous and contains two sexes each, making it a decad, which it said, kind of confusing. But that does mirror the 10 spheres in the Kabbalah. And this was described as the first man, or at least, I guess you could read that as the blueprint for the human soul. And then... Correct. These things just came out of the father, or whatever they're calling it. But Right, he wasn't active creating. That's something really important to note, because the Demiurge is very active when it creates. Right. And the then the the next thing they do is between Barbello and this father, Barbello takes some of the light from the father and begets him a son, which is like a different way of creating that we've seen thus far. And then in this mythology, this is Christ who then asks the father for mind and then he gets the mind and then he says the word and that creates everything at least in the at least in the apocrypha of john at least that's and this is like getting anime level confusing um to paraphrase uh one of the eons named sophia whose wisdom itself gets the broad idea to emanate without her creative partner and accidentally gives birth nice yeah to the abortive 
lion faced serpent she named Ayal the Beowth with flashing fiery lightning eyes. And Sophia's response was, What the fuck? And they'd cast the abomination into the outer darkness so away f- hey, from the hit, light. Hit it in some clouds. Like, just yeah. hit it in some. <laughs> Let's put some sparkles on it. Clouds. So, like, don't look at this. Nobody can see this. Yeah, just like cover but it. it. When she hit it in the clouds, when she hit it in the clouds, though, the Demiurge couldn't see that there were other gods before him. So it, it, it that's why it's also known as the blind god, oh. uh, uh, which is uh, the angel of death in Hebrew. But say, say that uh, part again, because you cut out. We're having connection problems. Oh. You said <laughs> oh, like, sorry. So when the Demiurge was born, it was shrouded in clouds to be hidden from the others. Right. And uh, cast out of being ever to exist and the only being there ever was. So it's known as the blind God or also known as Samael, which is an angel of death in Hebrew. And it also has another name from Aramaic. Uh, it was called Saklas by a, by one of, I think another E uh, um, because Saklas means fool. Uh, I think he has one more name in there too. I'll see yeah, if I he's can supposed to it. have three names because there's like a lot of trinities going on because you were talking about how if Barbello and God emanated, a, that's the Christ consciousness. Yes. So it's not literally Jesus Christ, but it's the consciousness that uh, occupied Jesus's body. It is the son, the true. And what I find interesting is that in actual Christianity, you have Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is where it should be. The Holy so Spirit the is what? Husband, you cut out real quick. The Holy Spirit is where the female should be in the Holy Trinity. But they've taken her out, and now she's a ghost. That's what my mom, who was raised Catholic, said. That was so Which I would argue. I would argue that Mary is a good archetype for that, because Sophia went to Mary to give her Jesus. And Sophia, therefore... Is kind. That's what the Holy Spirit is. Is the breath of Sophia? Yes, because Ieldebaoth, who's now hidden in these clouds, like you said, he doesn't know there's anything else now because he's in these sparkle clouds. Which is a pretty Barbie move, if you ask me. It's like just dazzle him with sparkles. He won't know what's going on, right? Yeah. This is what's said about him when he's in the sparkles and when he he because he goes and he creates within this realm, right? Uh, yeah, he starts making stuff. Yeah, like this, he makes a bunch of angels first of all, and then goes from there. This is what it says here. This is the first archon who took great power from his mother, and he removed himself from her and moved away from the places which he was born. He became strong and created for himself other aeons with a flame of luminous fire, which still exists now. And he joined with his arrogance which is in him and begot authorities for himself. The name of the first one is Athoth, whom the generations call the Reaper. The second one is Harmas, who is the Eye of Envy. The third one is Kalila Umbri. The fourth is Yabel. The fifth is Aduneo, who is called Sabaoth. The sixth one is Cain, whom the generations of men call the Son. The seventh is Abel. The eighth is Abrasine, the ninth is Yobel, the tenth is Amurpidil. I don't know if I said that right. The eleventh, this one's gets harder. Melsir Adunin, the twelfth is Belias, and he who is over the depth of Hades. And he placed seven kings, each corresponding to the firmaments of heaven, over the seven heavens, and five over the depths of the abyss, that they may reign. And he shared his fire with them, but he did not send forth from the power of the light which had taken from his mother, for he is ignorant and darkness. So he's just like a really gnarly, like, bad guy. I mean, yeah. It got me to really question some of the uh, organized religions. And when the light had mixed with the darkness, it caused the darkness to shine. And when the darkness had mixed with the light, it darkened the light and it became neither light nor dark, but it became dim. Now the Archon, who is weak, has three names. The first is Yaltabeo, the second is Saklas, and the third is Samael. So yeah, we did say all of them. And he is impious in his arrogance, which is in him. For he said, I am God and there is no other God beside me. For he is ignorant of his strength and the place from which he came. Then like there's an archon for every day of the week and then every day of the year. It just goes on and on. 
That's- yeah, and archons are are different because they're something that I've gathered from these texts is that this is a god that that is like you know how humans have introspection and we can like analyze our reactions to things and change the way that we are react yeah. because of our intellect. This is like a god that's made with none of that. So it's like an animal god. Basically, it's like a it's an autonomous and that's why I guess it's re- represented by the lion and the snake because it's of the earth it's an animal so and it's ignorant of where it comes from that's that's something really interesting i thought is that these archons these rulers these people that want to make things and rule them and program their minions or whatever that's looked down upon. that's not the highest spiritual being there is these are lower beings well what's funny is is that also makes sense in combination with the timaeus because we learned that god or the demiurgos fashioned these lesser beings that were like animals they were like these animal creatures that were on specific orbits so i guess the serpent's tail makes some sense and if Mm -hmm. they're these like like lions and whatever animals and then that makes perfect sense actually so here i have a note too where he is first called samael is actually by his mother sophia really or she's like actually because because of doing this she was cast out of heaven uh yeah that's kind of a bummer and then she she had to occupy this like middle grounds, which I guess a lot of people will liken this to um, uh, purgatory, which Catholics have that and a lot of other places do. But she's kind of in this middle realm that floats between heaven and earth. And a lot, a lot of times you see her trying to she tries to meddle with her son's uh, creation to try and get the creation to figure out that it needs to go back to source. So something that she does is when when he was lording over all his little archons that he made um she called out from the heavens in this in this you know in a in a godlike voice and said you are mistaken samael and that's the first time he was called samael and this is from the hypostasis of the archons which is another text so after they after they all heard this voice come out of nowhere what how do you say his name yaldabov yaldabaoth yaldabaoth was obviously confused and yelled out to question and challenged the voice. He said, quote, <laughs> if any other being exists before me, let it be shown forth to me. So after that, Sophia stretched forth her finger and brought limit- limitless light into matter. Uh, apparently from this, they, they sought the source of the voice and they found a reflection in some water. But him uh, yell- yelled at both and his uh, archons thought that she was inside the body of water instead of realizing that she was a reflection from heaven. So this just, it reiterates how foolish they are. I mean, like men, they think the object is is the talking to them, whereas it's just a reflection of something that they can't see. Okay, and in the version I read, he's shown an image of the divine pentad, which would include the barbello necessarily, and the form of the human soul. And he's yeah. he's tricked into breathing his life into it, which passes the power that he got from his mother into the humans. Right. Um, uh, another another part of the story is like looking in the reflection he saw. I mean, if you see Sophia, she's of God anyway. So I would say that he would have already had the blueprint from looking at one of those eons above him anyway. So I didn't see anything about the actual God spirit of God talking to him, but he did get that uh, blueprint. And then that's when he made Adam. But when he first made Adam in my text, he, uh, he made this body and everything, but it wouldn't move. It wouldn't do anything. And Sophia is the one that breathed into Adam to, to create life. There's definitely different versions of stories, but it's somehow like we were infused with Sophia's life and the Archons and the Demiurge don't have it. And they're like, they feel tricked by it. They're pissed off by it. They want to get it for themselves. That uh, eternal um, God power or spirit. And he, he imprisoned it in the human body. So our, basically the Gnostic texts are telling us that flesh bodies, human bodies that contain a spirit, the spirit needs to be liberated. So your human body is actually a prison built by y- Yeldabaoth to, to keep you here on his plane, to empower his own plane instead of 
it's kind of blasphemy against his mother and and God. Well, that makes sense because in Genesis, we are there just to tend over the garden. Yeah, we're like an animal then. We don't, need, we don't know where we're from. We don't know who we are. We don't know what's good and what's bad. We don't know right from wrong. And then the the main story is basically the snake is like, here, take a bite of the apple. You'll become as gods. And then God is like, well, listen, if you eat the apple, you're going to die. Well, they eat of the apple. And then Adam eats because Eve asks him to, supposedly. And when God gets back to the garden, he can't even see them. He's blind to them somehow. And he's like, where are you? Is this like I think it's funny because that's what he's accused of being in the Gnostic scripture is blind. And if they have been infused with the power of the gods or the aeons and he hasn't he doesn't know even know what that is. He they they're not even apparent to him anymore, which is strange. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing that the Gnostics always poked at and said that if God is omniscient, then he would need to ask where they are. He would have not said to not eat of the fruit. He would have been like, I don't care. Just do whatever. Yeah. Yeah, or he would have given it to them. Um, and then this is really interesting because, okay, all of my, this is what I'm reading this from the the hypostasis of the Archons, that text. And they go a little bit more into it. Basically, y'all have heard about Lilith, which is the Adam's first wife, quote unquote. It, this is interesting. She in didn't like Gnostic missionary. Text. She didn't like the missionary. She didn't like being a subordinate. But this is very interesting that in the Gnostic text, uh, Barbello actually sent Adam a helper named Epionia, which is who she's also called known as life or Zoe would be the, I guess the Greek term for that. And it, basically this was a, um, this female was a light being sent from directly from heaven to help, to help blame the spirit that was trapped inside Adam's body. So she she helped him and told him about his true source, like where he really came from. So and then um, uh, Yaldabaoth, who was uh, jealous, he uh, saw that Sophia had sent this this avatar, I guess you would call it. And there's some interesting stuff going on here, like that he tried to rape her. And that actually he he had and before but before he could rape her her body the the spirit of barbello left the body the human body or whatever and went into the snake and in, into the tree and then got adam to eat the apple or eve yeah that doesn't sound exactly like the uh, native american Trans, mythology. transfiguration stuff going on where the the heavenly mother actually is the serpent and the tree of the, the tree of knowledge is to free the spirit from Adam so that they can go back to, you know, real heaven and be freed from their prison. But of course that didn't work. Well, in the rabbit episode, that sounds like the agave plant. I mean, there's probably lots of plants that have this likeness, but I mean, when I read the story about that and then I learned about Kundalini and how serpents are actually um, holy, they're, they're very spiritual, like they're good animals. They're not bad. Um, they represent transcendence. So I just thought that was interesting that the snake could could have been perceived as a good, like a helper character. But when Yaldabaoth discovers that there has been some shenanigans going on, he basically bans them from the garden, which he had created to make it life easy for them. So he just ended up punishing them even more because they went behind his back and tried to escape. And speaking of which, if you would like to hear the rest of the show, head on over to www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit where for five bucks you can hear all our extended shows and I'll send you stickers that are really big at no extra cost to you. And if we have any time, there will be additional shows for you each month and you'll get access to our high resolution artwork from the Instagram. And most importantly, you'll get into our discord where you can play Minecraft with us and discuss all sorts of weird esoteric topics. Thank you for listening. Uh, Mari, will you do the honors? Eat carrots and shoot lasers.